Charlotte, should I do this in here or out there? Test it in here or out there. I'm pretty sure it's okay. Testing. Uh, I can hear you. He, I just got a thumbs up.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to St. Paul's Episcopal Church and to the 2022 Lenten series. My name is Charlie Dupree, and I am the rector of St. Paul's. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. And for those who are returning, welcome back. Uh, before we begin with a prayer, would you please take a few moments and silence your cell phones. Let us pray. With the rising of the sun, life rises again within us, O oh God. In the dawning of the morning light, you lead us from the mists of the night into the clarity of the day. In the new light of this day, bring us to a clearer knowing of the mystery that first bore us from the dark. Bring us to a clearer knowing of the love from which all life is born. Amen. Amen. Before I bring out today's speaker, I want to speak just a little bit about our speaker next week. If you look around you, you will see some very detailed and beautiful works of art called the Stations of St. Paul's. They were intentionally created to allow St. Paul's, literally, to look at our history and our past. Each station depicts a specific moment in the story of St. Paul's history with an intentional focus on race relations. Next week, our speaker is Janelle Washington, the artist who created these works of art. And we'll hear more from her about her own journey as an artist and her process for researching and creating these powerful images. But first, we have today. Similarly, our speaker today focuses on the power of art. And I was particularly interested in having the Virginia Museum of Fine Art represented in this series because they, like the church, are being very intentional about who they have been and who they are called to be. Once again, I'm joined in conversation by Barbara Holly, who is our senior lay leader at St. Paul's. And Dr. Michael Taylor is the chief curator and deputy director for art and education at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Prior to his appointment at the VMFA in 2015, Dr. Taylor served as the Muriel and Philip Berman Curator of Modern Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art from 1996 to 2011, and Director of the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College from 2011 to 2015. At VMFA, Dr. Taylor has led the curatorial education and exhibition teams to new heights of success, and he was recently named as the Project Director for VMFA's upcoming expansion project. Please help me welcome Michael Taylor. Thank you so much, Charlie. Yes, and yes. thank you, Barbara. It is such a pleasure to, to be here today. Um, Charlie's an inspiration. We had a coffee in the museum's best cafe uh, Beth O'Leary had put my name forward as a potential speaker, and I was telling Barbara earlier, it, it was like looking in a mirror. Your vision for St. Paul's was so similar to our vision for VMFA, to be inclusive, to be welcoming, to be for everyone. So I'm here today to really talk about a work of art, um, and Sarah, and if we could have the next Michael, slide. Michael, if I could, I want to I tee this up a little oh, bit. Oh, please Here's do. Here's a story. I didn't tell you this, <laughs> but um, when uh, my husband and I moved here two and a half years ago, we live uh, right off the boulevard across the street from the VMFA. And we, uh, so we were a part of the, the process and seeing the rumors of war statue go up, and we were at the opening. Um, but I have to tell you, there was a friend of mine who visited very, very recently after that from New York City, and he came down, and we uh, were at a restaurant, and he said, oh, by the way, um, 
I think that Rumors of War statue is somewhere down here. <laughs> <laughs> because to Northerners, all the South is the same thing. Right, right. And he meant it's somewhere down here. And I was like, oh, well, that's cool. I saw that. It was in Times Square. Um, so we walked to dinner and I intentionally took him through the VMFA and I said, oh look, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you're kidding me. <laughs> well, thank you How for doing that. How did it get that. here? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the journey of this sculpture and, and really to use it as the, the point of departure for a conversation. That's what today is about. Um, so this is Rumors of War. It's by Kahinde Wiley. Um, who is one of the most successful young African-American artists working today. You may know him. He painted the portrait of President Barack Obama uh, that now is, is owned by the National Portrait Gallery. And he's really just a very esteemed artist. And in 2016, when I first arrived at the museum, we had a, an exhibition of his work. And if we could have the next slide, please. So the seeds of this sculpture really go back to 2016. So he came, he gave a lecture, and we had a plane ticket for him the next day. And so Alex Nodges, the director, and myself were very surprised one week later to see him at the airport. And we were like, what happened? Did you come back? You, you, you liked your exhibition so much? And he said, no, I never left. I saw Monument Avenue. Mm. And he was with his brother. And he is, his family is from Nigeria originally. And so there's a lot of twins in Nigeria. And so he has a twin brother who's an accountant who lives in LA. And he was so struck by Monument Avenue, he wanted to respond to it. He didn't know how. He didn't know what he was going to do. And it, it shook him to his core to the point where he phones his brother and he was like, you need to come. And they spent a week and he started to envision a very large scale monument of his own. And this is one of, one of the 3D renderings. And of course, it's, it's after the J.E.B. Stewart monument, which is no longer there, but it was at Stewart Circle. And I think he chose that work because it actually, of all of those monuments, it had the most movement. The, the, it, it's, it's the most Kehinde Wiley of them. Um, if I could have the next slide. And you may know his practice. He, he essentially does something called street casting. And his belief is that when he would go to museums as a young man, he would never see himself in the paintings. He would see Napoleon and Julius Caesar <laughs> and Winston Churchill. <laughs> they all look like me. None of them look like Kehinde. And, and, and he wanted to see himself. He wanted to find paintings that elevated him and, and that he would be proud of and, and saying, look, that's me. So, Street casting, essentially, he, he looks for um, mainly young urban people um, in, on the streets of Harlem, uh, sometimes internationally. He travels a lot. And he, the way he works is he will show images from the history of art to these ostensibly models. And you can see it working here. Um, on the far side is a painting by Franz Hals who's one of the great Dutch old masters. And it's Willem van Heitusen, and he's holding a sword, and he's very dandified. He's got that wonderful rough collar. And then you see this young guy in, in you know, the Timberland boots and the, uh, the, the kind of accoutrements of a, of a young urban youth. He's, he's in, essentially in a Sean John tracksuit. But he's got the sword, and he's similarly against a very bright colored background. So, so this is what Kehinde Wiley's work is all about. It, it, it's about representation and expanding the, the community of people who are shown in museums. Next slide, please. 
And he loves horses. So he, he had, before he did the, the monument that we have, he had painted many people on horseback. And of course, it gets a, a very dynamic composition. There's lots of movement. And that's why I think he chose the Jeb Stuart. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this was the largest work of art he ever made. Uh, one thing you have to remember is the Jeb Stuart from, from um, ground to top was 30 feet tall. Mm. His is 30 and a half feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can kind of, you can really get the sense of, I don't think I've ever shown these images in public before, but you can really get the sense of this. That, you see how big that horse's head is? This is an enormous piece. Th this is essentially the clay version, and you probably know from, from the way bronze casting works is, is this is the preliminary. This is the first version, and using the lost wax method, he will eventually cast it in bronze. Uh, next slide, please. And there he is signing it, and you can see it had to be held up in scaffolds in an enormous warehouse. And then we had to ship it from China. Imagine that. Next slide, please. And Kehinde being Kehinde, he is a, a showman. He doesn't do things in half measure. So when we talked about the unveiling, he said, well, I want to unveil it in Times Square because it's the place. He's, he, he essentially lives in New York, so he wanted it to be almost his hometown. But he said, we will have two million people see this sculpture before it comes to you. And, and that's true, and you, you, you get the sense of it. And it was remarkable in Times Square because it was playing with all that, that sort of like advertising and billboards and the cacophony of, of noise and the visual chaos. It somehow worked in there, but we knew it would be even more poignant, even more meaningful when it came here. So its final destination was always Richmond. It was all, we commissioned it, but he wanted to debut it and, and he was right because yeah. the attention, I mean, if, if you imagine, uh, and we fight with this every day, you know, Richmond is not connected to Amtrak. We don't have a lot of direct flights. So um, I think Kehinde really hit on the fact that every art magazine, every newspaper covered it, and then it came here. Mm. And I think he was worried that if we unveiled it here, it would just be something is happening in Virginia, but then it was like that yeah. you could sense the anticipation, like when is this coming well, to he wanted Richmond? to get it on the radar yeah. differently, right? And this became the art piece of 2019. It was absolutely covered around the world. Uh, next slide, please. And there you see it sort of up front. Um, and I love that there's an American flag because the meaning of this in New York was very specific as I said, to his kind of street casting approach to say, you know, you've never seen someone who looks like you on a horse. Now I'm giving it to you. So it's very empowering, but it had an, an even different and, and deeper meaning here. Uh, next slide. So this is the unveiling. It was in December of 2019, and it was an absolute nightmare. Many of you were there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had this theater company that had drapes, and I swear we did three dry runs. <laughs> the theater, the, so, so it was essentially covered, and there was Velcro, and you, you just gently pulled it, and in the three dry runs, it just fell away, and there was the beautiful sculpture. Well, what happened was, the heavens opened. It got soaked, and, and the, the theater drape got heavy. And the sculpture, the, the guy on the horse ha has dreadlocks, and they're kind of spiky. And so the weight pulled the drape, and it, it actually punctured the spikes. So we were down the bottom pulling, and what we didn't realize, we were making things worse. So then the fire brigade came, and they, they, they were like, well, we got it. So they got on a ladder, and what they had to do was go up and over. 
I was sitting with Gehinde Wiley's mother. Oh, and dear. she <laughs> very poignantly said, this is just all part of the struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, she really got it that she was never worried. Um, I was trying to not freak out because <laughs> it really did take a long time. But she thought it was actually great because it showed that if, if we are building a brighter, better tomorrow, a more inclusive future, it's going to be a struggle mm -hmm. and we're going to have to get there and it's not going to come easy. Next slide, please. So that's Kehinde. By the way, he designs his own clothes. So he came in this amazing outfit. And he was really, really amazed by the turnout. I think he thought there would be 500 people. There, there was 6,000. And I think it really, his speech kind of reflected. He, he was very moved. And I think he really got what this means, that, that his reaction was shared by many other people. Uh, next slide, please. And I want to mention the late Bill Royal. So this sculpture began, as I said, in 2016. And a key person was Bill Royal. And Bill and Pam Royal were our collectors. Mm -hmm. Bill sadly passed away last year. But he was someone who knew Kehinde. And he, he basically said, you have to do this. It has to be at VMFA. How can we help? And so having Bill in our corner really made this happen. He was chairman of the board of trustees. So this commission had to be approved. And there was no doubt. And, and a whole bunch of funders came forward. And it was Bill leading that effort that without his leadership, we probably could have done it, but with his leadership, we did it in style. Next slide. And then, of course, we didn't know what was going to happen next. So December 2019, we unveil it. And in the summer of 2020, you were all here. We start to see the Black Lives Matter protests. We see the projections of George Floyd. We see the protesters on the street. And many of those protests ended at the Kehinde Wiley sculpture with the laying of flowers. It became a focal point of this. And if I could have the next slide. Um, so this is it at, at night. And, and what I think is really interesting is how this all plays out with the title. And many people don't understand that the title is actually comes from the Kim James version of the Bible. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And Gehinde spoke about that at the museum. And I've really taken that to heart, because sometimes when you try and change an institution, you are told, well, you can't, you know, that It'll be a disaster. You'll lose your donors. You'll, you'll lose your visitors. These are the rumors of war. You need to ignore them because you're on the path. You've got to stay true to the path. In the summer of 2020, many museums in this country woke up to the fact that their collections and their communities were really two different things. And, and they, they had failed to recognize this. And it was almost like they had to be told that they were actually out of touch and irrelevant. And to become relevant, they were going to have to do the kind of community outreach that we at VMFA had really made the cornerstone of our strategic plan. And I think that's something to remember about what we're doing. It didn't start with the Kehinde Wiley. In a way, the Kehinde Wiley was the bookend of the first strategic plan. We're now in, into a new strategic plan that's taking us forward. And there are many, many people. We have a great leadership team. We've, we have wonderful community outreach with Paula Saylor Robinson. We have Patrick Petrong, our, our, our head of, of uh, DEIA. So there's, there's a whole team of people who are making this museum better. And it's a journey. We're not there yet. We're nowhere near there yet but we're on the right path. 
And I feel like when, when I look at the Kehinde Wiley sculpture and I see it every day on my way to work, that it, it reminds me of that path we're on. And I want to live up to that. I want to live up to the, that sculpture and what it means because as, as a member of the leadership team, I know it falls on my shoulders and those of my colleagues to make this happen, to make the museum a better place. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yes, yeah, so this goes back to the protest. So this, <laughs> this is Clifford Chambliss III, who was a protester, who ha held up a sign at almost all of the protest that says, rumors of war wasn't a rumor. And this is Valerie Castle Oliver, our curator of uh, modern contemporary art, who reached out to him and said, I think that needs to be in our collection. So we acquired this banner, essentially. And this was the photograph we took. And, and I, I show that just to give you a sense of this is, this is not something we expected. Um, when we unveiled the Kehinde Wiley sculpture, we didn't know what was going to happen next. But I think it was really incumbent upon us to use that moment to really understand really what this piece means and, and what it stands for. So and Clifford Michael. Chambliss is now an artist in our collection. I don't think he imagined that during the protests. Uh, you may, you may uh, might mention this, but um, just as you're looking at the museum to the right is, is the Daughters of the Confederacy, yes. right? So going back to the riots, uh, that building was trash. I mean, it was really, it was really heavily yes. marked and hit. Um, what it, this was not up right. clearly, but I, I just feel like there's such a stark, yeah. Um, they're right within a stone's throw of each other. Well, I remember that night, and in fact, there was a, a so the the United Daughters of the Confederacy building is built really well because it it was set on fire and it nothing happened it kind of the curtains burned and and there was damage inside but the the building is like a bunker um there was a big crowd and i think it could easily have turned on vmfa but there was a cry in the crowd that said leave vmfa alone and i really feel that sculpture was a big part of that but I also want to say, I mean, I feel this is, this is not just VMFA, this is Richmond and the story we want to tell and the city we want to be. And I think that's something that all of us, I think, can really take on, which is our story is not yet written and we can't change the past. We know the past, but I feel we have a bright future but we've got to come to terms with that past. And I think that's what Kehinde Wiley did. And I think I've got one more slide. Yeah, so I just wanted to, with, this is the last slide I'll show you. So I wanted to, to point out that this didn't happen in a vacuum. I mentioned the strategic plan, which was all about community outreach. It placed an emphasis on African and African-American art. And that was acknowledging our history. So we opened in 1936. We were actually acquiring works of African-American art very early in our history. We were one of the first museums to buy a work by Jacob Lawrence. But then you get Brown versus Board of, Board of Education and the massive resistance to school integration. That is when things change. Suddenly our Leslie Cheek Theater was segregated. We had colored bathrooms. The winners of the fellowship prizes for artists, if they were African American, had to come to a different entrance. That history stays with you. If you don't own that history, you never move past that history. So we knew that there was a period between 1954 and 1970 when we didn't buy African American art. And that's the period of artists like Romer Bearden. So part of the strategic plan was to give funds for African and African-American art to redress that balance, to create a better collection that reflected the community in which we live. And that was, that was where the Kehinde Wiley came from. 
we wanted a sculpture at the front of the museum that was welcoming and signaled a new era for the city, the museum, and the state. We didn't know it would be contended Wiley. That fell in our lap, and I'm glad it did, because I think it's one of the true great works of public art of the 21st century. And with that, all right, Why we'll begin we... our conversation. Yeah, let's open, <laughs> let's open it up a little bit. Um, and Sarah, could question. we go back to the image of the Kehinde? Oh, or maybe we don't need it. I think you know what it looks like. <laughs> and you've got a handout. <laughs> Michael, it's an open door to the museum. It has been a journey. It's been a journey for most of us. Yeah. But the journey's not over, as the message says. Yeah. When you um, walk inside, can you tell us a little bit about what has changed inside that we can look to see in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, so we have to get the visitor experience right. If you come to a museum and see a great exhibition, but you feel like you've been followed by a security guard because mm. you don't look like the other visitors, we've failed. If the bathrooms are not clean, we've failed. If the line is too long in the cafe, we've failed. We've got to get all of the visitor experience right so that you feel that this is your museum and it's no longer a club for a, a small few, it's a museum for everyone. So it's definitely, it's got to be every aspect of that visitor experience. Then you, you've got to look at the collections. And what I like about the journey that we've been on is in 2015, it was really African and African-American art. And many of the curators, the other curators who maybe have collections of ancient art or South Asian art, they're kind of like, well, that's not really to do with me. Mm. Now, they feel very differently. They're looking at the diversity of their collections. They're asking the same questions. And, you know, I think that's been a wonderful alignment that we have now. So I feel when you look at the VMFA today, it's a very vital place. It's a very exciting place. Um, the Dirty South exhibition, I think was another watershed moment. We couldn't have done that five years ago. We really had to do the changes that needed to be made. Um, but that exhibition was the New York Times Exhibition of the Year and Catalog of the Year and the LA Times Exhibition of the Year. Wow. So these are accolades. People are waking up and they're wondering what the secret source is at the VMFA. Yeah. Well, and the answer is love. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's bravery. I love think it's bravery, bravery and, and dis intentional decisions on the part of leadership to move in, in this direction. And yeah. I know uh, being a part of a church, whenever you do that, you risk uh, pushback. Yeah. Did you get, are you getting pushback? We, we get a lot of pushback. I'm actually looking at, at Caprice Bragg, my great friend and colleague. So we, every week, the leadership team gets a report of all the emails and phone calls and letters, and it's called SharePoint. And boy, did we get a lot of negative and positive. The thing is, people, I, I, I feel like change is difficult. And some people felt we were being political. Now, I would argue that doing nothing is also a political statement. Doing something is, I mean, it, it, you, you are basically standing for something. And there were, there were many people who, you know, said, well, I'm not going to be a member anymore. I actually think, we haven't seen visitation go down. We've actually seen membership go up. I, I think many of those people have come back. And I think there was a, a sense in which they felt we crossed a line that art is about beauty and this seemed to be about something else. When you analyze that, what is that something else? Mm. I mean, we have paintings of battle scenes and emperors and 
we got rumors of war in all over the collection. Yeah. But then we have a sculpture by a young African American artist who's putting a man with ripped jeans and Kyrie sneakers on the horse. I think that was something that was too radical for some people, but then I think it also changed. I mean, the number of people, we had problems with tour buses coming to see it. And the number of people who actually started to come because it did its job, it said, this is your museum. You are welcome here. Yeah, I'm going to move. I want to ask some questions out and about, but as I move, it strikes me that most of the, the I call it entryway art, you know, tends to appeal to the masses. And if you want to see something political, then you go into this little exhibit hall and you make right. the choice. So right. perhaps putting uh, <laughs> this statue out was, was definitely like, this is, this is who we are and this is what we want to be about. Yeah. Beth. Do you know this person? I, yeah. <laughs> hey, Beth. You said this is our museum. I, I just am urging you to give the elevator talk to remind people this is our museum. This is a state owned. This is yes. the Commonwealth of Virginia's yeah. Fine Arts Museum. What most people don't know is the magic of public-private partnership. They don't know one penny has not purchased any art in that museum since 1936. Right. Can you explain that? Because so I think it's an amazing story. So that was one of the, the sort of misleading pushback was um, state funds sh shouldn't be used for this. But in fact, as you said, Beth, it, it, there wasn't a penny of state funds used. It, it, it was private money, and I mentioned Bill Royal, who was a major donor, and because we are a state agency, we serve the whole Commonwealth of Virginia. We're not the Richmond Museum. Uh, we are as much the, the Bristol Museum or, or, you know, the Arlington Museum. I mean, there's, we, we are the whole of Virginia. We're also free and open 365 days a year. And that is something so unique in American museums. And when we talk about being a welcoming and inclusive museum, and then you have to pay $20 to get in and another $50 for parking, you, you know, you're not being welcoming anymore. And I think that's something that, that we're very proud of. So I would say one of the things that this sculpture does is it alerts you to the fact that there is a past and we can't escape it, but we've also got this future. And I would say that as a state museum, we feel we're doing our job by reaching everyone in the Commonwealth. I, I feel in, in the era of massive resistance, and even after that, we didn't see that primarily as our, as our role. I want everyone to see VMFA and have those amazing experiences. And people might not be aware of this, you know, we're very involved now with our education. We do distance learning. Um, you think in the age of, of COVID, you know, we have live streaming into classrooms Sometimes kids can't get to VMFA. It's a long way to, to Bristol and Grundy, but we can actually have an art class live stream. We've also got the artmobile going around the state and reaching people. Many, many older donors tell me, you know, I remember when it came to Fredericksburg, that was the first time I'd seen a work of art like that. And we're trying to make those memories happen again and those experiences and really live up to being a state museum. Great, um, we've got a yeah, cut please, you off. Yes. We could do another question here. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Hi, uh, Vienna. It's Vienna. Uh, I would like to hear something about the new direction with the new edition that's coming. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's good to see you, Vienna. Um, so we, as a museum, we've tended to have expansions roughly every 15 years. Many people will say to me, haven't you just built the new wing? <laughs> and that was 2010. So they also take many years to plan. 
So the new wing is off the, the current Mellon and Lewis wing, the 1985 wing, and it is going to be a, a special exhibition space, giving us a second special exhibition space so that every day you visit VMFA, you can see a wonderful exhibition. Right now, there's a gap. You, you, you close the Dirty South, and then you have to wait for Man Ray to open. So there's this kind of gap. We also have galleries for 21st century art, uh, for American art, and for African art. So we're kind of, it's really this strategic plan initiative writ large, and having the galleries for the works that we've acquired. Um, there'll be other things, there'll be wonderful event spaces and education spaces. It's fulfilling our mission, and we want it to be wonderfully welcoming and inclusive. So there'll be lots of community outreach. Great. Dr. Taylor, I'm excited about the new addition too, and I want to put in a plug for bringing back the leaping hair that used to be in the front and window. And you've got it, you've got it on your <laughs> necklace. <laughs> so, first of all, thank you for calling it a hair, because it is a hair. Many people will say to me, where's the bunny? And, <laughs> and I'm like, I think it's a hair. So, yes, with more gallery space, we'll have more room to bring it back. It's a great question. <laughs> um, you touched on the necessity of facing the past in order to move away from it. I sense that there's been a, um, a sense of liberation for the museum, having taken the steps you've taken. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think it is liberating. Um, I, I think for a while there was a sense that if you, if you look at something like the Confederate Chapel, there was almost a sense of like, oh, I hope you visitors don't see that. Or even the Robinson House. I mean, Beth wrote a beautiful book about the grounds that really told the story of those grounds and their history. And that is what I mean by ownership. Like, once you tell that story, you can own it you can start to make it part of your programs and no longer be ashamed of it. Like this, these are all teachable moments. And I feel with the way, the trajectory we're on, we're no longer afraid to address these issues. I, I think many museums are really afraid to deal with their history, but you have to. It's the only way you're gonna move forward. So it is liberating. I think that's a great word. Uh, last question. As a proud member of the VMFA, I've never sent an email or anything, but I want to thank you for the steps you have taken you. and for rumor of war, rumors of war. As a, a pastor at First English Lutheran Church, which was the backdrop of J.E.B. Stewart uh, in Stewart Circle, we have dealt with this very much in our own context, and I appreciate what you said about change being hard. Yeah. Uh, because we have, you know, across the spectrum in our neighborhood and congregation, those conversations. And one of the things I realized was that for some people, um, while they said, yes, it's time, and yet even though they were, they were for this, uh, this change, seeing the statues come down, it was hard because they'd never really thought about it. It was just part of growing up. You know, they'd always yeah. been there. And so... Part of the pastoral care was helping people move through that, uh, and I think it continues to be um, for us. So I've learned some patience in that process as well. But to my question, we now have a, a void where there, there was for a long time a plinth with no statue, which I think was harder for people, and now, of course, empty spots. There's been some rumors that perhaps the VMFA has been in conversation with the city about what might come next in those circles, and I wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah, sure, I mean, I think, so, if you remember, early on, we were tapped by Governor Northam to kind of come up with a plan. You know, what's gonna happen to Monument Avenue? And for various reasons, that didn't come to pass. The city now owns the, the Lee Circle and that whole area, so it's really up to the city and we are, are, you know, happy to talk to anyone. 
<laughs> and we have great expertise on staff, but I think that's also up to the city to do. Um, we're not in, in active discussions right now, as far as I'm aware. And thank you for being a member. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to close things up here, um, but I'm just struck by, I mean, I remember coming into this church uh, two, year, two and a half years ago when I was interviewing and thinking, um, you know, this can feel a little bit like a museum, but it's yeah. not. It's a living, breathing, That's active right. space that we want people to come into and to be out in, in the midst of the community. So I appreciate you helping to model that. Yeah. Um, and I hope that we are also contributing in that partnership of uh, how to make uh, all of our spaces more welcoming yes. and inclusive. So thank you very much thank for being you. here. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, just a reminder, next week, Janelle Washington will be here and will engage in conversations around her works of art. Um, and uh, there is a collection plate in the back of the church, uh, just in case you'd like to leave a donation. Those monies will be used to support this particular series. Um, immediately following this, uh, you're welcome to move over into our parish hall and pick up your lunches if you pre-ordered them. We do have some spaces available in Scott Hall and in our garden if you'd like to enjoy those lunches here. And you can even pre-order for next week's uh, lunch. That will be a, the last of this series. Um, again, thank you all for being here. If you'd like, and as you're able, you are welcome to stand for a blessing. My siblings and sisters and brothers, remember that life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those with whom we share this remarkable, beautiful journey. So make haste to love, be quick to be kind, and may the blessing of the Holy One rest upon you and those you love in this moment and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Michael.